And so I thought, man, you could, and I'd done a piece where I did them in a circle and then kind of took sticks and made something in the right. midst of it. So it looked like it was kind of floating, you know. Small scale, you, you really see the wire a lot and you got to put a lot of things in there to make it convincing. So I thought, well, I'll just do it huge, you know, why not? Right. And so I thought, I'll build a floating mountain. And the idea was you I made this kind of ingenious thing of wire that I hung from the ceiling and then shot to the floor uh-huh. and connected together. So I had like a framework. And I thought, all I got to do is make like a topographical map. Yeah. And make a circle here with these sticks and wire them on. Right. And then you just, and I had a drawing of a mountain. So I kind of, and you just keep going up, you know, and it'll make a yeah. mountain. And so I got about three quarters of the way done and looked at it and it it looked like nothing. You couldn't, you could get no <laughs> idea of the form. It just looked like a bunch of kind of wiggly circles in space. Right. I thought, oh man, you know, what am I going to do? And then I realized, well, you, you take another piece and connect each one of those yeah, lines you, together this way and then this way. Right. And that'll make the form and that'll fill it out. And I thought, you know, why didn't you think of that before? It took like three times as long to build as I thought and right in the middle of it did I was, it start getting heavy did you ever start one, uh, worrying no, about uh, no it didn't know? it didn't get heavy because I used these small sticks and since it was spread out it was I mean the whole thing right weighed right. a lot but no it it, it, it all kind of supported itself yeah. I mean I didn't figure this out as an engineer I just kind of did it because I thought it would work and it did and I get all the way to the top and I look it's a mountain it, it, it was amazing to me right know? And plus, you weren't supposed to get inside of it, but you could slip underneath there and walk around in there. And it was right. like you're inside this gigantic mountain of shape. It was right. pretty pretty cool. Uh, in the midst of building this, too, they had a huge ice storm. I was right in the middle of it, and I couldn't get home one night. So I had to spend the night there and then come in, and I actually finished it the next day. But uh, Did you sleep under the mountain? No, I stayed in a motel. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, but, that, was a, that was a... Yeah, and that... And then I did uh, another piece. Francis did one at the Irving Art Center on one side of the room, and I did one on the other. It was the same concept, and these were even taller. They were like, uh, damn, I think maybe close to 25 feet tall, maybe 30. And it was like an iceberg shape. Mm-hmm. In other words, if you saw the bottom and right. the top of an iceberg, and uh, that was an interesting one because it so was kind of conical, but then it had kind of a mountain shape on you know, the top. To the top, and then the bottom was kind of the same thing. Yeah. And I did three of them in this room, different shapes, and I studied icebergs, you know, and uh, and that was an interesting one. Putting it up because it worked like a dream. I had a lift, and I built the mm-hmm. whole thing, and then I of course took all the wood off, taking it down, and then when it came to taking it down, I realized. There's no way to really take this thing down because I built it this way. And if you take this top piece down, because I built it like this and I kind of uh-huh. supported it as I built it up. If you cut the top loose to take it down, that's holding the whole thing up, you know? Right. So I basically had to sort of destroy it taking it down, which is another big lesson. I should have right. planned it because it, it actually was not very safe either. Well, you know, it kind of reminds me of Andy Goldsworthy. It's similar to the types of materials that yeah. he uses and, you know, those things, they're just kind of, they're site specific and yeah. and they're not made to be taken apart. No. Other than by nature, which exactly. is like part of, you know, his whole sure. mantra, right? It's but, funny you should mention that mountain too, because that was a, that was a good. I love that piece, and it only exists in. Uh, I think I've got uh, some of the wire back there and some of the wood, but only in photos, you know. Right. And so, uh, but it's not the la- last mountain you've no, made. No. I mean, you've uh, no. so you on the studio uh, tour you were giving me, you were showing me the the, the maquette for uh, mountains down in Sam Houston. At Sam Houston State, yeah, that was a piece at this new building at Sam Houston State. And Francis did a piece in the lobby there, and uh, those worked out great. And it's interesting about those mountains because those mountains came from that. I don't know if you've seen my work where I've done those waterfalls. Waterfalls, right? And I used to do these waterfalls. Spillway sh- and yeah, uh, and, and most and the original one was striped wall, striped floor, and then mm-hmm. these rods bent like this uniformly, but you know, changing the bend as you change the mm-hmm. top curve and it makes a more apparent like falling water you know right i did several of those i even did one out of steel kind of the same way with the front and the back right. you know and then one day i was thinking about getting trying to get in another show in japan so i thought man 
you know, you can't really put a sheet of something behind something because then you got a front and a back. So if you're making right. a sculpture, you need to be able to walk around it like this. And I realized if you take, make a hoop like this, you do have a front and a back. And so mm -hmm. I was able to make this thing kind of like freestanding waterfall image thing, you know? Right. Which worked out great. Very successful in this show in Japan, except they didn't buy it. So you saw it in the parking lot sitting out here. <laughs> That's it. But anyway, that, that led me, because I thought, if I can do that, why can't you make a mountainous form like that Right. and bend these and kind of intuitively kind of shape it like a mountain, you know? I mean, I guess, of course, you could go to a computer and take any mountain and draw that thing and then bend them to each. But, you know... I, that kind of stuff's a little hard for me to learn right now, so I thought, well, let's do it by hand. And so I, I, yeah. I've actually came up with the design for those mountains five or six years ago, and there was mm -hmm. just never a place to do it or the money, and this thing happened to come around. It was a real nice commission, I have to tell you. It worked out good. That's awesome. You know? But it's something that, and it changed a little bit because I had to make like a door on there that you, not a door, but an opening where you could actually go inside of it, which kind of, work better i think than the original ones so sure and so you know as i was mentioning i was walking around earlier you know those, those pieces <laughs> mm -hmm. uh that uh that have the striped background mm -hmm. you know when i saw the images online at first you know i wasn't sure the purpose but then <laughs> i started thinking about okay if i were moving past this this would be a lot like a, a lenticular animation yep exactly right? what it is yep and I'm like, it's there's going to be this thing is going to be really humming and resonating, and it's really you're really going to get a sense of movement, even though it's perfectly static. Right, right. And and so when when did you? I assume, <laughs> I, I I assume that that was probably also part of your thought. And like, at what point did you start realizing that you wanted to use those vertical stripes? And don't say first grade. Yeah. Well, okay, <laughs> preschool. No. Uh, I, you know, I, I explained the thing about the Venetian blinds, but, you know. Right. You, 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 I'm trying to find something in here that does that. That, that fan over oh, there. Oh, right, exactly. Doing it right there. That, that still fascinates me. I love looking at it. You know, back in the ARP, uh, ARP art, op art days, yeah. they took that, did so much of it to a fault. I mean, you buy a right. damn shopping bag and it looks like that and everything was psychedelic, you know, patterns like that. Kind of took all the interest out of it for me, but mm -hmm. I still have always been fascinated by that. I kind of wasn't thinking about it as much as artwork until I realized if you took that same thing happening there and don't make everything do that but make something do that along with something else you know right then it gets interesting because you've got this thing over here that's kind of buzzing and moving on its own and you don't you can't figure it out and then next to it is just some stripes i mean it's almost like right. a it's almost like a 3d 2d thing mm -hmm. that's moving and i'm not doing anything you know right. I mean, it's it's like kind of the perfect uh painting sculpture uh movement in your artwork kind yeah. of piece you can get and it's basically line over line right you know? it's over the years I've, I've tried to really make it less and less and less where i just did a piece recently it's very small it's a striped panel and all it has is a kind of a piece of wire looped around it mm -hmm. and it does the same thing but it's just one tiny wire that that does that so it, right to me that is much more it's just as beautiful as a whole waterfall looking thing just that one right. wire mysteriously changing i think on my uh that instagram page i told mm -hmm. you about that piece is on there in fact it was in that show barry had in his office at the last show i was in that he not the last the last show i was in at barry's this is i'm with barry whistler gallery I, I, right and uh he's been really good to me over the years by allowing me to do these things in his gallery that's you know, like the last show it, I did his old gallery was just two pieces, one in mm -hmm. one room, one in the other, a rug piece and a piece that stood in the middle of the room that kind of balanced on a beam. Right. I mean, they were interesting pieces, but that he let me take up the whole gallery with those two pieces. Fantastic of him to do that. This last show I was in, he had a show up front, and then he has a new wall, a 12-foot by 12-foot wall he's real proud of. And uh, in the back area there, and uh, so he was in the studio one day, and he, you, you saw this piece out there. Yeah. 
He said, uh, I was working on something like a strapped wall with, I mean, not found objects, but basically things from the studio that I'd kind of made that weren't really anything, but I knew they would kind of get going on the striped surface. Uh -huh. So I kind of leaned them at different angles and crossed them and did things. And right. So Barry walks in and goes, is that a piece? And I said, well, it could be. And he goes, well, let's do this. And so again, he let me put this one piece in the back room, just mm -hmm. that, in the whole back half of the gallery. Right. And it it looks pretty good in my space, but in his space, it just looked incredible. I mean, it just, it's kind of like the best place you could put this piece and the lighting was right and all that. So anyway, it worked out good, you know. Yeah. Good for Barry. <laughs> I gotta tell you that. And good for me. Right, right. And uh, so, um, but those things I think I'll continue to do. I mean, again, I like make them as really simple as possible, mm -hmm. but sort of real concentrated in areas. You know, it, it's right. It changes. I don't know, but I, I know you guys are you know work on uh, like the big public art. But mm -hmm. do you do you think about doing smaller pieces that move faster out the door? <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> we talk, Francis and I talk about that a lot, you know. We, we do like the freedom to do whatever we want to do, especially in gallery situations. So she's been allowed that over the years, and so have I with different galleries to do what we want to do. Even if they don't sell, they still allow these things to happen, right. which, I, again, you got to praise those gallery owners because, you know, that's that's they're in the business to show wonderful art. Right. To stay in business, they need to sell wonderful art. So, you know, right. to, to take a whole space and give it to an artist that just as for an installation is, is good. We both like doing that, but we both know we need to make smaller work. And we have made right. smaller work over the years. It's something, I don't know, it seems like the older we get, it might be a wise thing to do too right. because these things might be a little easier to transport and work on and... and I've actually got a bunch of stuff started back here that I make models all the time and I'm not going to make models for sale. I'm just not going right. to, for sale, I'm just not going to do that. But I can make small things that do what these big things do. Mm -hmm. As of yet, I haven't figured out how to do them where it pleases me. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. I mean, there's, and I see stuff all the time. I go, God, that that's sort of what I want to be doing. I mean, that, the way that person did that, if I could just... And I, I need to concentrate on that, and I know that'll come. It's just you have to think about it more and more and more. And that that's something I would like to strive for, making things mm -hmm. that I could sit on that table there right. that would do, not do exactly what these big things do in here, but you get that same feeling from it, mm -hmm. you know? And it's not that it's a, oh, it's a miniature of that big thing. This is actually no, a real sure, piece, yeah. but it happens to be smaller. Sure. But look what the hell it's doing, you know? Yeah. Somebody wanted to find you. Where where are you out there? Okay, it's uh, tomor dot net is the website. Okay, uh, barrywhistler dot com. He's got a he's got a nice web. I think this is still an yeah. He's got a nice website, and he used to have some videos of me talking about stuff, which is take it one way. It's it's either extremely funny or extremely <laughs> informative. I don't know, <laughs> but they're good. And uh, Barry Whistler Gallery, uh, his website, and then uh, this, we both just started this Instagram thing. So, right. uh, Instagram, uh, ha uh, what is it? The uh, at at, at uh, Tom or Art. Right, <laughs> right on. Yeah. Well, I hey, I appreciate your time. <laughs> and, Thank uh, you for doing one. this. I yeah. really enjoyed it. Thank you. Now, the news. Artists usually believe that their work is their legacy. Long after they die, the work will still be there to carry on. However, things have a way of changing, and sometimes artwork has a way of just disappearing. For example, Jens Gauchat's sculpture Pillar of Shame, which was placed at the University of Hong Kong in 1997 as a memorial to those killed in the 1989 Tiananmen crackdown. As we all know, the political climate in Hong Kong has changed. In October, the civil rights organization that originally commissioned Gelshot's work received a letter from the university asking them to remove it. Since then, the organization was forcefully dissolved along with other civil